Look, my friends. Yeah, bias, huh? Okay, no. So look, my friends. You know that in uh, is this my? Sorry. You know that in China, right? There is a lot of persecution of the church because it's a communist country. Okay, so the church is being persecuted. They are bringing down the crosses. For example, in Bunchou, they're bringing down the crosses from the churches. Yeah, and many other things are happening. But aside from the physical damage that you have from the crosses being burned and all that, there is also persecution of people. So the Christians are undergoing, like the Christians of the first centuries, a lot of suffering just because of their faith in Jesus. And so because they are Christians, they are arrested, they go to jail, many things are happening to them, and a lot. And they suffer a lot for the faith. You can consider them like modern-day martyrs for the faith. But because of this, because they suffer for the faith, the faith is something that is very precious to them. It is not something that they take lightly for granted because the simbahan is in front of their house and there are 20 masses a day and you can just cross the street. Because you can just cross the street, you don't cross the street because it's so easy to get. It's so accessible and you forget about the value of it because it's too easy. But for these people, because it's something that is difficult to get, something that they have to fight for, then the faith becomes something very precious. Because they cannot just walk into a church. They want to have mass. Their church already destroyed. They want to have mass. They have to have mass in the houses. They have to have mass in secret. And because of all of this suffering, the faith is not just something that is accidental because they have to risk something in order to be Christian. They have to risk something in order to belong to Jesus. Now, I will tell you a story about a person from this communist country, China, and his name was Li. If you can identify him, good luck. Yeah? Many Li's in China. So, if they want to have mass, they have to have mass in secret and normally in the house. And when they're having mass, they always have to be on the lookout. Because sometimes somebody will report and then the police will come and arrest them. So one day when they were having this secret mass from a priest that is an underground priest that has to move from place to place in order not to be arrested. Somebody reported to the police and as the mass was ending, they said, hey, the police is coming. So everybody ran. Except for Lee, because it's his house, he cannot run. And the police came and they arrested him. And when they arrested him, they took him to their special room comfort room where they give him comfort and they ask him just one question. Tell us where is the priest? Only this. Where is the priest? And you tell us where the priest is and you can go home. You tell us where the priest is and you can go back to your wife. You tell us where the priest is and you can go back to your children. But he knows if he tells them where the priest is, his family will not have the mass. His family will not have the sacraments. His family will not have the confession. And all the people in his village will not have this for don't know how long until they can find another priest. So he did not reveal. And they did many things that I will not tell you, but they did many things to him. The point is, he resisted. He did not reveal to them who the priest was until they started to recognize. They came to the realization that we cannot break this person. We cannot force him to do this. And so they left. They let him go home. This man is a hero of the faith. He's a hero of the Eucharist. He's a hero. His man has probably done more for Christ, for the faith, for his church, than any of us will do in our lifetime. He's a hero, yeah? And so after he went back, he started to realize, and so he, with great effort, they secretly moved, all of them. They migrated and they went to the United States, the land of the free, yes, and the home of the brave. Not so much now, but the land of the free. And when they go there and they went to the United States, they found that it was so nice, the feeling, that you can walk in the broad daylight and enter into the church. 
and you can have mass anytime you want. Parang here, right? You can have mass anytime you want. You can go, the churches are open. And they felt that it was so nice, so great, this feeling to be able to practice your faith. But he also realized another thing, that in this United States, the land of the free, if you work hard, if you work very hard, you can make money. And you can give to your children, and you can give to your wife the things that you did not have in China. And so he started to work hard. And from the daily masses that he used to attend, because of all the work he had to do, I'm so busy, I got so much things to do. He only started to attend mass on Sundays. He said, okay, wife, you take the kids because, you know, I have to work. I have to work. Many times you hear this from the people here. Why are you not coming? Because I have to work. I have something to do. And later on, he started to realize that if you work harder, they pay you more, especially on Sundays and holidays. And so he started to miss occasionally the Sunday Mass because he had to work, right? But on holidays like Christmas and Easter, he used to go to church until he found out that during Christmas and Easter, they pay you even more. And he was very tired because he said, oh, okay, and he only started to go occasionally. And last Easter, he didn't even go for Easter Mass a few days ago. I received a prayer request, pray for this person because he stopped going for Mass last Easter. What happened? What happened? This hero of the faith that undergone a lot of torture, a lot of suffering for the faith, for the Eucharist, for our Lord Jesus Christ, that the communist persecution and the communist torture was not able to break his spirit. But when he went to the United States, the culture there was able to transform him. The culture was able to break this hero of the faith. And you know what? It was not even trying. The communists tried. They tried very hard. Not successful. But the culture, they're not targeting him. You're just going there. You're doing whatever you want. And they changed him. That's why you need to be aware. You need to be aware of what is going on in the culture. That's why we lose our people when we send them to the universities, when they go to the city. And something happened. Our oratory children, something happened to them. What is this thing that is happening? Because the culture, the culture is like for the fish in the tank, right? The fish in the aquarium. The culture is like the water. It's all around you. You absorb it. You breathe it. You live in it. You move in it. It affects you. The culture contains things like this. All these things, that is the culture, your language, your rituals, the thing that you do. But like the water in the fish pond, if the culture is polluted, if the culture is dirty, if the culture is unhealthy, you are affected. Even when you know it, or if you don't know it, you will be affected. The church knows this. That's why... It has always evangelized culture. And that's why somebody's institute, I'm not sure if you know this, have the charism of evangelizing the culture. Because the culture is important. The culture is where you live. It's where you move and you breathe. It's what shapes you and forms you unless you are the ones that shapes culture first. And this was realized by an Italian guy. This guy, he looked like he got electric shock on his head. But... Antonio Gramsci realized this and he says that the culture is the dominant ideology of the society. What the society believes, the perceptions, the values, the morals. And if you want to change how people behave, you have to change the culture. And he says you have to speak you know, of a struggle for a new culture. And this new culture results in a new moral life. The moral life regulates what you do, your actions, how you behave. That is you. You are what you do. Because your way of being is manifested in what you are doing. Operari, sequitur, esse. 
So, this new life, until it becomes a new way of feeling and seeing reality in 1923, imagine the world in 1923, almost 100 years ago, how it was. And imagine the world now. Because they had a plan to transform the culture. What is known as critical theory. And this plan of transforming the culture is going on until today. So from a failed revolution, that means the communist revolution that happened in Russia, but they were not able to make this revolution happen in Italy, was not able to make this revolution happen in the United States, was not able to make this revolution happen in Germany. What they do? Critical theory. So the goals of those revolutions, everything that that revolution wanted to happen, happened. But secretly, that you don't understand, you don't know. It's happening right now and you're not aware of it. So we must be aware. For example, the goals, you know, the goals of it, you know, teaching homosexuality to children, to make confusion, to the, the laws are always changing, the morals are changing, immigration to dissolve the society. The goals of the Frankfurt School in 1923 is exactly what is happening now. People have a plan. Do you have a plan? Do you know what's going on? Maybe you should. So... Society today and people who are living in a society today, they are slaves of many, many, many things. And you can see this if you are paying attention to the children around you, if you are paying attention to the, I don't know how to describe it, but let me just tell you, that's a bull. And the bull is using the CR. And the contents of the bull's CR is what the people are watching on the TV these days. Yes, I'm not sure if I can say this word, but that's exactly what is happening these days. But you must understand also another thing, and which is the topic of our talk today. That is a theology of history. Because we live in history. We live in time. We are beings that live in time. And because we live in time, we are affected by all of this. From the beginning of the world, from the beginning of the world, of the universe, from the beginning of humanity until the last day when the angel finally blows the trumpet to herald the last judgment, we are people who are living in time and we are people who are affected by all of this. But we need to also know that time and space and culture and all of these things is not random. Yeah? It is controlled by God who guides by his divine providence the happenings of history. A few days ago, you had the Paschal Liturgy. And in the Paschal Liturgy, we say in the blessing of the Paschal Candle that Christ is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Right? He is the Lord of history. And that is why we put the year on the Paschal Candle. He is the Lord of history. If Christ is the Lord of history, He's guiding the progress of history. That's why the Bible tells us in the fullness of time. What means in the fullness of time? So it's not random that Jesus was born in Nazareth in that place in that year. There used to be the Christmas proclamation and it tells you all this history of salvation. So in the fullness of time, Jesus came to redeem history as the Lord of history. In the fullness of time was the incarnation of the word. Because God is, as God is guiding history to its completion, we also have another player. He also have another player, and that is Satan. And the goal of Satan is the opposite of that of God. He is the enemy of God. Sometimes we are confused. Our enemy is this person whom I don't like. Our enemy is that person whom I don't like. Our enemy is this person who is annoying me. Yes, but we have an enemy, and that enemy is Satan. He is the true enemy. And just as Christ is guiding all of us through history to reach our end, that is happiness and in heaven, forever and ever, Satan wants you to, to lead you to another place. Just as Christ is the head of the church and we are the body of Christ and the head guides the body because the head gives direction to the body, pointing us to our eternal home. And just as God, who has created all of the things in the world by His power, guides creation to its fulfillment, there is another one that is the ruler of this world, that is Satan. And he has another goal. And so history is this 
contention, this contention, yeah? Satan contending against the goodness of God. Satan trying to deceive people. And just as Christ guides history, Satan distorts history and he distorts the culture. And you need to be aware of this fight that is going on. That is the theology of history. To understand the reality of this battle. And where is it happening? In you. In the souls of men and women. That is where the dominion is fought. That is where the dominion is fought. And it's also happening in the culture that is around us today. Just as Christ mentioned in the parable that the sower sows the good seed. He's sowing the wheat. But an enemy comes in the night, in the dark, and he sows the, the weeds. You can ask Deacon Sajiwan, a lot of weeds. You can, they're sowing the weed. And what happens? If you pull out the, the weeds, you might also pull out the wheat. And so the master says, leave them until the end where there will be a separation. So you must understand that this thing is going on all around you. And everybody has to make a choice. And this thing happens also, ah, also in culture. Why in culture? There are some, there are some cultures that is evil. Huh? Some cultures that are clearly inspired by the devil. This Aztec culture where they offer human sacrifices, they catch people and you know, bring them to the top of their beautiful temples. You go there in Mexico and you go into South America and you see this beautiful temple and say, wow, the purpose of these temples is to offer human sacrifice. It's evil. And the culture is evil. Why we must pay attention to this? Because this reality, very often, they block it out. They say that before the Spanish came bringing Christianity, even in Philippines, they are saying this. The people were so happy. No, because some cultures are positively evil. And with the coming of Spanish, especially when you see the movie Apocalypto, all these beautiful structures they have that is dedicated to evil, they were transformed because the culture was transformed. And they stop all of these evil things. There are good things of the culture. I don't know what, but I'm sure there is something. Maybe the music. Not the demon music. Maybe some paintings. But at the heart of the culture, what is this? This is the heart of the culture. In Carthage, for example, you will see child sacrifices. These are the graves that they discovered of children being both sacrificed. And these are evil things. And there are good cultures. And there are evil cultures. You have to be aware of this. That's why when we evangelize the culture, we have to assume what is good, but not everything can be assumed because some things are evil. You assume the, the child sacrifice. You cannot assume the child sacrifice. And it's so massive, massive scale. And who inspires this? Satan. Who inspires cultures to do evil things. And the Mayans and the Incas. And today in Africa, there is also child sacrifices in the Sudan. When they have a new business, someone kidnaps a child to kill and sacrifice the child. Google it and check. Sacrifice the child. Because why? When you bury the child under this business and you put the foundation, the business will be better. And this is happening in our day today. And this is, not, this is not the will of God. And so there are evil things in culture that is happening all around us. And to understand what happened and why these things happen, we need to understand a few things. The first thing we need to understand is the universe. What is the universe? Father Javier spoke about this this morning. The first call is the call to be, right? The call to be. And so you have things that exist in the universe, things. And then you have the call to be alive and you have living things. And then you have human beings who are called in natural life to have an intellect and a will. But through this intellect and a will, they are called to the supernatural life. And so there are many lives in the human being. All these things that we have talked about, St. Augustine in the City of God speaks about. And he says there are two cities. The human society can be divided into two cities. The city of God, where God is at the center, and the city of man, where man is the center. And he's at the center to the detriment of God, where God is put aside. Do you live according to your design 
or God's design. So there exist these two cities. Why is it important? Two cities have been formed by two loves. You see, ah, it's the love. Huh? The earthly love by the love of self. And if you love self before God, you are in the earthly city. But if you love God before self, the heavenly city. Yeah? St. Augustine in the city of God. And so all these things are in man. And many people today think that man is only just man. is an animal. But man is also a spiritual being. That a spiritual being that has a soul that is called to be living forever with God in eternal happiness in heaven. And that is why we talk about the heavenly city. There is a manifestation of this heavenly city. A manifestation of this heavenly city that reached its height in the Middle Ages. It's, we don't like Middle Ages. This word is bad. It's in the middle of what? We prefer to call it Christendom. The dominion of Christ. When Christ is Lord, Dominus, in the dominion of Christ, you get Christendom. And Christendom has an order in society. And many times when we look at this order in society, we thought, wow, okay, there is an order in society. But we do not know that this order is not arbitrary. It's not an arbitrary order that happened by chance. Or it's not, ah, the church is trying because of its political power to dominate. Because many times we are hearing this. Why must the church be on the top? No. I will explain why. Because in men, there are different dimensions. We talked about this. The first dimension of man is man is a thing. And being a thing, he shares this reality with all the things in the world. The, the chair, the stone, the minerals, the water. Man is a thing. It's a created thing. It's a reality outside of your mind that exists in the world. Yes, man is a thing. But man also is an animal. From the Latin anima, has a soul. And the soul is the principle of life. So man is a living thing. And as a living thing, he has processes within him. He has a digestive process. He has a process of a respiratory process. He has a circulatory process. All these things are part of man as a living being that he shares with the other animals that have sense. Right? He has a sense of sight, a sense of smell, the sense of taste. And he is a sensitive being that is part of his animal nature. Yes? But man also is a rational being. And this rationality that he has, this intellect and the will that man has, differentiates him from all the other animals. Because the dog does not have intellect or will. It has instincts. And the instincts can be very similar to human instincts, but they are instincts. And the cat... We will not talk about the cats. But the cats also have instincts. Yes? But man has another calling. Because his soul, unlike the soul of animals, is an immortal soul. He is Kapak's day. He has the capacity for God. So, just like the, the, the living parts of man, his circulatory system, he circulates, he eats. Why? He eats in order that he is alive. Why? In order to use his intellect and his will. If a man is just eating and eating and eating and he's not moving and he's not doing any intellectual work and he doesn't love, we say that this man has reverted to his animal state. Because the lower things serve the higher things. And the man is alive so that he can exercise his intellect and his will to know God and to love God. And he has this intellect and will to know and love God in order to reach his supernatural end. And so the life of every human being has a higher end, the goal of the life, that is to be with God in heaven. Yes? So there are these realities, these dimensions in the man. The thing, the animal, the rational, and the supernatural. Yes? Pay attention. These things, right, have an order. That means the man does not live for his stomach alone. He doesn't live just to be a thing alone. He lives for his highest end. And that's why man projects these dimensions into society. And that is why society has this structure. 
That's why you have the economy of execution. You have the workers, the people who plant, the farmers, the fishermen. But the fishermen, they do not govern society. They are not a society that is governed for the sake of fishing. That is not the way it is. And you have the people who direct it. Because if everybody is a fisherman, then you don't have vegetables. You don't have chicken, you don't have egg. So somebody with the capital, the bourgeoisie, they, they, they regulate the society. Say, okay, look, we need this amount of fish. This, 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 this. Yeah? And they direct the fishermen. But these bourgeoisie, these people who direct the economy, because they are the economists, they, are, they do not govern the society. There is the one that is the governance, the aristocracy, the, the levels of governance that govern because they direct the common good of society. You understand the common good? Not, not only from this barangay, not only that barangay, but the development of everybody that should be. Not only development in one place, Metro Manila very developed, this place Parangubat. No, you have to have even development because you need to find the common good because it's not the people here is worth more than the people there. The common good. And so they direct the society. Who is the, the one that is stronger? The army or the mayor? Of course, the army is stronger. But what do we call a society that is governed by the military? It's a dictatorship. We know that it's not supposed to be like that, even though they are stronger. So the one that governs is the one that takes care of the common good. But the common good, you have peace, you have prosperity. The water is working. The sewage lines is working. My Oriente, no brown out. Why? It's so that the people can achieve their end. That is to reach heaven. And that is why above the society, above the governance, above the king is the church. Because it is the role of the church to direct the people to their supernatural end. And if the church stops doing that and it loses its mission, there is a problem. Just like if the governance loses its mission, there is a problem. You understand? So that is why society has this structure. It has this structure because this structure exists in the human being. And we project it into society. You understand? But now we make a distinction. There is a distinction between Christianity, that is the Christian faith, where Christian disciples are, you are a Christian disciple, in your place there's mass, okay, there's Christianity, you understand? But it's different from Christendom. Christendom is something that is different. What is Christendom? Christendom is the lordship of Christ over everything. And Pope Leo the Thirteen, in his encyclical Immortale Dei, not Leo the Twelve, Leo the Thirteen, one eye is missing. He says there was a time when the states were governed by the philosophy of the gospel. The power of the gospel, the power of the gospel, diffused through all levels of society, permeating that is infusing itself. Then the religion established by Christ, right, has the protection of the society. What means this? It means that, for example, society does not tolerate something that is evil against the divine law. Even if everybody wants abortion, just like everybody wants a free meal, you don't give everybody free things. You don't take the money from all the people who work for it and to give to the people. And then what happened? Nobody will work. We do not steal other people's things to give. Because it's wrong. But now we make laws but we do not care whether it's right or wrong. Because we try to follow the will of the majority, but sometimes the will of the majority, because the majority is stupid. And you cannot follow the stupid majority. You have to guide them. You have to govern them. That's the role of the government. Not to just indulge whatever. And that's a problem. But in Christendom, they were governed by the power of the gospel. When kingdom and priesthood are one, the world is well ruled and the church flourishes. Yeah? Immortality. Day. And this is the order. The order that exists in medieval times is a projection of the reality of the human being. It's not only something that, ah, okay, medieval times and it's gone. But what happened? What happened to this order? Who is the enemy of God? Satan. And if the order is there, what happens? Everybody is led towards his end. 
right? They go to heaven, right? Who doesn't like this? Satan. So, he, as one of the players in history, overturns the order. And it happens in three revolutions. In the first revolution, that is the Protestant revolt, the Protestant revolution in 1517, this order was overturned. So, the king now decides what religion is. And you can see very well in England, in Germany. The king decides. There was the first revolution. So they remove the church. So they say, yes, we believe in God. Yes, we believe in Christ. Church out. No church. Comes the second revolution, the French Revolution in 1789. And what happened? They got rid of the king. They got rid of the king. Execution of the king, King Louis. What happened then? Who goes up? The one that is at the bottom of the king, huh? the bourgeoisie, they move up. And they say what? Yes, God. Because they are deists. No Christ. So the week, one seven days a week, they become ten days a week. The new goddess is not Jesus. They put a, a new goddess. Reason is the goddess. So yes, God, but no Christ and no church. And the last revolution is the communist revolution. And this time, the workers, you know the workers, we talked about this, right? Suddenly now, they are at the top. This is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's something that is contrary to reason. And you have the overturning of the order of God. So, this time, no God, no Christ, no church. And this is the society that we have lived in. It is the inversion of man from what he was meant to be. The inversion of man that is meant to live in his life according to the will of God to reach his end is gone. That's why we must understand this very well because many people think that Christendom, Christianity, the Middle Ages, also called the Dark Ages, walang ilaw, huh? because everything was bad and sad and dreary. Everybody is just fighting around, crusading left and right, you know. And the people were poor and hungry, walang no food, you know. And there was slavery and all that. The first thing you must understand about the Middle Ages is all of this is a lie. The Middle Ages, which was Christendom, was the height of flourishing of many things. The universities, the height of flourishing of learning. Cambridge, Oxford, the Sorbonne in Paris were all established during the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church invented university. Google it. On Wiki, you'll find this. The Catholic Church invented the institution of the university. We are not against learning. We promote learning. We drag the, the Dark Ages out into the light because the Dark Ages was not caused by the church. It was caused by the barbarian invasions. The barbarians were not Christian. It was the church that Christianized and civilized them, that brought the light to them. They bring the dark. Yeah? And it was the time of flourishing of great minds. Albert the Great. That's why great minds. You have also St. Bonaventure. Yeah? And the greatest of them all, St. Thomas Aquinas. The time also is symbolized by the architecture. For example, you look at the Saint-Chapelle in Paris that was built by the king, St. Louis of France. And look at this. Is, is dark to you? It's not dark because the architecture symbolizes the world view, the cosmo vision, the culture of its age. So you must know from what it fell. Now look, look at this. This is the small town of Lincoln in England. It's a very small town. But what is at the center of the town? This is Lincoln today, uh, not Lincoln of the Middle Ages. Lincoln of the Middle Ages, less people staying there. But why in this small town in the middle of England, you have such a big cathedral? It's Lincoln Cathedral. It's huge because of the centrality of faith. The faith for them was in the center and it is displayed not only in the structure of society that you saw, but also in its architecture, in the way the people live their life, in the culture. And it's the same in the sound of Wells. You have never heard of Wells, maybe. It's a very, very small town. But you have Wells Cathedral. It's ridiculous. It's huge. In a small town of like 7,000 people, everybody can go there. 
how long it takes to build one cathedral? A hundred years. And the people that start this project and put all the money in it, they know they will never see its completion. But it's not for them. It's for God. And that's why when you go around your barangay and you see that the many of the houses are better than the chapel, you need to bring back this Christendom to understand this, this reality. And it's duplicated everywhere. In hundreds of times in Winchester, you see, look, this is a small town. Boom, one big church comes out. The centrality of faith that is manifested always again and again. This is York. And in a small town in England called Salisbury, in the 13th century, they built the biggest and the tallest building in the world. This is the spire of Salisbury Cathedral. And it's ridiculous. Huh? It's a small town in the middle of... And you have this. Why? That town has a bigger church than us. They honor God more than us. No, no. We honor God more than them. Salisbury Cathedral. And it's a sign. And it's not only in England. It's the same in France. Chart, for example. In the middle of nowhere, as everything is flat and boom, you have one. And it's the same in Italy. And it's the same in every place where Christendom was. And when I told you about the structured society, it's not that oh, all the governors, because they are king, they are corrupt. Do you know how many kings and rulers there were saints? I did the research. The list is very long. Very long. Because even though they were kings, they are not sitting down in their couch and saying, more grapes, please. No. It's not like that. Because they govern to lead the people to heaven. And Louis, King Louis, Saint Louis of France, is one prime example of this. He, he spent his life like this because he was taught by his mom, Blanche. And there were so many, so many kings, so many kings, Casimir of Poland, the Ladislaus and Elizabeth of Hungary. Huh? So many kings over and over, Edward the Confessor, you know, so many kings, so many kings who were saints. So it's not a time that was impossible to be a king and a saint because they understood their role. They understood their roles. Yeah, So many, huh? I, I cannot even list this customer of Poland. And Christendom is not only ended in the, in the 19th, 13th century because it extended. Spain, which is the mother of the Philippines, was an inheritor of Christendom. That's why, for example, when you have... Uh, the kings, they understood very clearly where their power comes from. The power comes from Christ. Christ is the one that gives authority to the king. That's why it was the church that gives the crown to the king. It's the doctrine of the two swords. The church exercises the spiritual sword. But the sword of governance is exercised also from Christ. Because Christ said, all power is given to me. So, that's why the church is the one that gives this. And it's very clear, for example, in some countries, look, when Elizabeth II was crowned Queen of England, she's not Catholic, but she's but when she was crowned Queen of England, right? She was crowned by the Archbishop who gave her the crown. She didn't just take it by herself. It's very clear where the source of the authority was from. Yes? When Blessed Karl, who was Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, yeah? Uh, Austria-Hungary, when he was crowned as the emperor, was the same. And if you pay attention to all the royal crowns, what is in the top? The cross. It is the dominion of Christ over the temporal power. Yeah? Remember I told you about three revolutions. All the crowns are the same. All the crowns are the same. St. Edward's crown of England is all the same, all the same, all the same. Yeah? And they call themselves king, king by the grace of God. Queen Victoria, by the grace of God. Victoria, by the grace of God. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen. So they exercise the authority and power by the grace of God who is above them. And you can see this very clearly. For example, in the Emperor Charles V, who was the king or the Holy Roman Emperor during the Protestant Rebellion. Remember, we talked about the first revolt, the Protestant Rebellion. Because even though he was king, over Spain and all the Spanish territories and all these things. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the Archduke of Austria. It was blah, 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 a lot of titles, yeah? But what happened? After reigning for a long time, realizing that he was growing old and weak, he did not choose to live in all his huge palaces, the Hofburg, you know, he doesn't choose to live in Vienna. But he retired to a small monastery, the monastery of Juste in Spain to spend his last days there in penance, in reparation, 
and to prepare himself to meet God. Because above him, the emperor was God. Very conscious of this. And he lived his life in this small little room, preparing to meet his Lord, the Christendom. So that from the emperor to the small nanai, they have the same view of the world. The same view of reality. You understand? It's very simple. And it's the same. Look, this is Philip II. He succeeded Charles as the emperor. What happened? He built this palace, the Escorial in Spain. But look at what was the center of the Escorial. It's the church. So the architecture itself symbolizes the cosmo vision that they have of society. And it's symbolized by laying the sword in this chivalry at the altar. The overturning always comes when the people crown themselves. Napoleon, for example, crowned himself because they reject the authority of the church. When Philip the Fair, for example, even in the Middle Ages, sent his animals to kidnap the Pope Boniface VIII and in the famous slap of Anyani, they tried to overturn the power, the spiritual power. So we have talked about the first revolution. That is the Protestant revolution. Because in the next two workshops, we will talk about the other two. Yeah? And it's very clear, the most clear expression of this Protestant revolution, the overturning of the spiritual, is by in England, in Henry VIII. Henry VIII wrote a book called The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. That is why the Pope gave him the title. He, he, he wrote a book, uh, The Defense of the Seven Sacraments, against Martin Luther. And his book was so good that the Pope gave him the title Defender of the Faith. Because he defended the faith. What happened? Because he wanted to get married, because he doesn't want to get his wife, they, he got rid. He overturned the church. He removed the power. He put himself. He is the king, the head of the church. John Fisher, Thomas More refused. All the other bishops gave in, except this. John Fisher, and they refused. And so the king overthrew the church and he became head of the church. He is one of the very, very clear expressions of the first revolution, the overturning of the spiritual power of God and the church by the king. And Elizabeth the first, and also Elizabeth the second, she is the supreme governor of the Church of England. You see? And what they did, these are all the monasteries that existed in England during the time of the Reformation. And Henry destroyed them all, the dissolution of the monasteries. And these are not small monasteries. These are, these are different monasteries, different very big monasteries. All were destroyed. All were destroyed. And he stole all the money from these places. And what about the schools? What about the charitable acts done by the monks? The monks were either expelled, if they were kind, or they were martyred. And this is the cause, as the story we talked about in the beginning. The Cartesian martyrs, all of these people were martyred. Edmund Campion was martyred. And the king became an absolute monarch. For example, in France, Louis was an absolute monarch. And even his prime minister, Richelieu, acted against the interests of the church, supporting the Protestants in the war against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, against the Christian Empire, in order to further the interests of France. So you see all of these things happening in the first revolution, very clear that leads to the second revolution. It was for political reasons. Like Philip, the elector of uh, Saxony, who supported Luther. And at the end of the war was the Peace of Augsburg. And what is the goal? It's expressed very clearly. Cuius regio, eius religio. He who rules his religion. So the king gets to choose the religion of the people. The first revolution. So the overturning of this order of society that we saw that was the projection of the realities and dimensions of man, of the human being, of man that is thing, animal, rational, supernatural, that has all these dimensions that he projects into society. So the order in society reflects the reality of man that was overturned in all these revolutions. The Protestant revolution rejecting the church removing the church, the French Revolution, removing Christ, and finally the Communist Revolution, removing God. 
giving us this culture that we have. The overturning of man. The inversion of all the dimensions of man. In the upcoming uh, workshops, we will talk a little, yeah, about a little more about the French Revolution. About what is liberty, what is equality, what is fraternity, what is the true meaning of this? Why is it inverted in the French Revolution? What is the meaning of all of this? And later, Deacon Ilojan will talk about in his workshop about communism and how it's materialism. It rejects the spiritual nature of man. And this evening, Father will talk about the cultural revolution that overturns the nature of man as a thing. Man is no longer a reality and reality no longer exists because of the principle of immanence. You determine what your reality is and you bend reality around you just because of what you think you are. You are a man. You want to be a woman. Okay, sige. And the whole world bends around you. This is the devil's work. And we need to be able to see the devil's tail, the serpent's tail, that he is fighting against God, who is governing with his providence the course of history. He's fighting against God to overturn the true nature of man, to lead man instead of going up to heaven. Now, he serves his animal nature, his sensibilities, and descends to where the devil is. We need to discern this. And it's the dissolution of man. It's the dissolution of man. And modern man, in modern society, now is this. Three idiots indulging the sensibilities. Giving to people what is harmful for them. Because of what? Fraternity. And the equal one just looks on. Okay, see game. It's your freedom. To do what you want, even is wrong and harmful to you. So this is the theology of history, to understand this fight and this contention. And this is the summary to explain to you the true nature of society that was in Christendom and how it was inverted by these three revolutions. The Protestant, the French, and the Communist. Thank you. Some question? No question. Very good. Pass. Pass. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Reverend Andrew. You're welcome so much. <laughs> you have any questions? Yeah. Comments. Uh, realizations, violent reactions. 